the Sustainable Development Goals. At the high-level dialogue, the UN Secretary General outlined his three-year roadmap for financing the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development that could serve as blueprint for the advancement of the regional financing for development strategies. The four areas of the roadmap are aligning the international financing system behind the SDGs, supporting individual countries in mobilizing domestic resources for sustainable strategies, addressing exclusion from financial services, and enhance international cooperation. These four focus areas combine with the various national, sub-regional, and regional approaches and actions will be at the heart of the issues on which this committee may wish to encourage members to share their perspectives. ESCAP can provide leadership to move this agenda forward. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, in 2019, this year, ESCAP's Economic and Social Survey of Asia and the Pacific, uh, the title of which, Ambitions Beyond Growth, estimates that our region, developing countries, or Asia-Pacific developing countries, should invest an additional 1.5 trillion US dollar per year, or 5% of their combined GDP to achieve the SDGs by 2030. While the Asia-Pacific region has been the engine of economic growth, it is high time that we align economic policy making with inclusive growth, poverty reduction actions, and climate smart growth in our region. This means gearing up for a decade of action and delivery for sustainable development. Allow me now to highlight three priority areas closely linked to the roadmap for financing the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development, on which these committee's guidance would be valuable. The first is on an integrated national financing framework to mainstream the SDGs into policymaking. With the changing priorities of government budget, national level financing for development strategies are the cornerstone of integrating requirements for SDGs implementation. The focus is also to leverage the participation of private investors through public-private partnership modality in areas such as infrastructure projects. The second is on financial inclusion and financial technology. I recognize the importance of enhancing the access to finance available to micro, small, and medium-sized enterprises with a focus on women entrepreneurs, as well as to explore opportunities of the digital economy and to boost inclusive business models. The third is on enhanced regional tax cooperation. Countries in the region need to address the challenges to increase tax revenues through policies such as broadening the tax base and minimizing tax avoidance and tax evasion. I'm confident that this committee can develop the financing for development framework needed for consolidating regional modalities in these areas to support the implementation of SDGs. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, in view of this, may I highlight three policy propos proposals for your consideration and further guidance. The first one is on an integrated national financing framework, which is essential to mainstream fiscal policy options, including changes to budgetary processes and fiscal incentives. ESCAP, in consultation with national policymakers, is working towards developing a guidebook to support country-level SDG costing. There is a need to align our economic development approach to SDG 12 targets, which is on sustainable consumption and production patterns, which can raise opportunities for environmental sustainability and green jobs. Second, 
A strengthened financing plan is key to tackle climate-related risk and to allocate more resources to the advancement of green economy. ESCAP is taking an active role in promoting the use of public-private partnerships and bond financing for infrastructure development and leveraging green bonds for climate finance with a focus on the least developed countries and their efforts to graduate. The emphasis here is not only to identify the sources of funds, but to pay a special attention to increasing the amount of access to climate finance and related innovative instruments. The third is on increase recognition of regional tax cooperation, which is needed urgently so that we can deal with the emerging challenges in the field of international taxation to support the Addis Ababa Action Agenda and the means of implementation of sustainable development. ESCAP stands ready to support the development of a revamped tax regime to tackle the new business models of dig digitalization, ranging from web-based services to remote employment and manufacturing activities by providing a regional platform for a broad-based consultation and cooperation among member states. Regional tax cooperation could further focus on sharing knowledge and information on new national tax initiatives, policy lessons, and best practices, and strengthening coordination among different sub-regional tax cooperation platforms and major partners and stakeholders. Going forward, the committee may wish to consider actionable modalities and instruments to support the financing for development agenda. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, we cannot work alone to advance this uh, roadmap. We need strong and sustainable partnership with the UN family and other international and regional organizations, including the ADB, to support member states and all stakeholders to mobilize resources for SDGs in our region. Together, we can raise ambitions beyond economic growth, promote national sustainable financing framework, improve financial inclusion, and enhance regional tax cooperation uh, to support uh, SDGs. Thank you for your attention. I wish you a very successful committee. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ibu Amida, for your welcoming remarks and for outlining the focus areas uh, this committee will be discussing in the next three days. Um, we are now delighted to have uh, Mr. Ahmed Jawad Usmani, Deputy Minister, Administration and Finance, Ministry of Economy, Government of Afghanistan, as the keynote speaker. Mr. Usmani, please, the floor is yours. Uh, Ms. Armida Alice Jabana, distinguished delegates, honorable representatives and colleagues from the UNESCAP, ONACTAP, and other development partners, Ladies and gentlemen, assalamu alaikum, good morning. First of all, let me to congratulate the UNESCAP for the organizing of the second session of the Committee on Macroeconomic Policy, Poverty Reduction, and Financing for Sustainable Development. This substantial work undertaken and the enormous technical documents produced between the first and second sessions of the Committee are invaluable. Availing of this opportunity, I would like to uh, extend my utmost appreciation to UNESCAP for all the technical and logistic support to my delegation and, and invitation extended to my country. <laughs> Afghanistan is a broad and landlocked and a least developed country so that we face double challenge toward inclusive and sustainable development. Conflict and insecurity further complicated our development path. In my country, Poverty is the second challenge of the war. While the both are interrelated, a prolonged war has led to high levels of poverty while the unemployed citizens are hired by tourist groups. The progress. In spite of being a landlocked and least developed and post-conflict and in-conflict country, Afghanistan had significant socioeconomic gains over the last 18 years. We made tremendous progress on gender issues. 
In 2001, during the Taliban regime, there was no girls at the schools and universities. But in last 18 years, the number of children in schools has risen by almost nine times. More than nine million children attend schools now, with 39% of them being girls. A third of our teachers in general education are women, with female teachers currently accounting for over 60% of graduates from teaching, from teacher training colleges. We have built 13,000 new schools. Health of Afghans has improved as well. Maternal mortality ratio declined from 1,600 to 638 per 100,000 live births. Child mortality rate fell from 256 to 67 per 1,000 live births, while the infant mortality rate declined from 169 to 47 per 100, 1,000 live births. At the same time, the life expectancy at birth has increased from 46 to 64 years. Connectivity has also improved significantly. The information communication technology is a fast-growing sector which covers more than 80% of the population, thousands of kilometers of, inter of national and regional highways and provincial routes have been constructed, while there is more to do with the transportation sector. The same achievements can be observed in all other sectors, particularly the banking sector, the strong and vibrant private sector investment in various economic sectors, a vocal civil society, and freedom of media, to name just a few. The challenges. Ladies and gentlemen, in spite of the remarkable, remarkable progress made so far, there are a number of the fundamental development challenges. More than half of the population do not have access to basic needs and services such as livelihood, health, and education. The economic growth is only 2.7% that can counterbalance the high population growth and it can bring health positive changes in poverty reduction, employment, and access to basic services. The trade balance is negative. Annually import is 8 billion US dollar while the export is only 875 million US dollar. Likewise, out of 16 million working population, only half of them are employed. External support has played a great role in economic growth of Afghanistan, but it was stringent and the support has declining. Official development assistance has gone down from $13 billion in 2011 to $5 billion US dollar in 2016. The reliance on external partners continues as 66 percent of the Afghan national budget is still funded by them. These huge flows effectively con con constitute a massive subsidy to the economy, distorting investment incentives, and artificially inflating the purchasing power of the population. The solutions. Taking into account the country's specific challenges, in addition of being a landlocked and among the least developed countries, Afghanistan has recently adopted a strategy called Productive Afghanistan, a strategy to capture key domestic markets and develop exports. The overall vision of the Productive Afghanistan strategy is to move away from an import-based to a production-based ec economy by linking expansion of commercial and small older agriculture with a strong forward and backward linkages to a small scale urbanization, urban industrialization. This vision relies on its long term development strategy called Afghanistan Agricultural Led Industrialization, which aims to achieve a small scale industrialization using agriculture as a springboard for industrial growth in other sectors based on forward and backward linkages. Afghanistan agriculture led industrialization can be characterized as output production, import substitution, and export promotion. In addition of the strategy of productive Afghanistan, briefly discussed, a number of other 
structural economic transformation are essential to move towards inclusive and sustainable development. Transport infrastructure. To link the rural modernization process with the rest of the economy and to ensure Afghanistan gradually develop its industrial base as part of the global economy, we need to ensure the building of physical as well as soft infrastructure. Remittances. For a structural transformation to succeed, we need to build a robust domestic private sector composed of micro, small, and medium enterprises. In order to finance the process, one may wish to consider the utilization of remittances. Although remittances are normally used for consumption, they may be used for investment to local, family, run, micro, small, and medium enterprises too. Political stability and institutional environment. In order to progress with the structural transformation and to modernize agriculture, we need to ensure political stability and adequate institutional environment, which will incentivize development of domestic private sector and its venturing into new industrial sectors. Landlockness. For making progress, landlocked countries such as Afghanistan must be able to reach global markets through their respective transit countries. For this, the international community must facilitate a closer regional cooperation and integration which will eliminate the physical and bureaucratic barriers to per economic interaction. This brings me to my last point on achieving 2030 agenda. The cost of achieving 2030 agenda represents a challenge for Afghanistan, similar to other landlocked and least developed countries. SCAP research shows that additional resources required annually for Asia and the Pacific, LDCs up to 2030 account for around 16% of GDP, as compared to 5% of SCAP of GDP for all Asia Pacific developing countries. If we think of this in terms of per person per day, least developed countries need $3 per person per day, compared to $1 on average for developing countries in the region. Given the relatively high poverty incidence in Afghanistan, investment needs to hint poverty are particularly high, at about 11% of GDP per year, with this being the cost of poverty, GAMS, transfers, and a universal social protection floor. With one of the youngest populations in the region and in the world, Afghanistan additional education and spending needs for its large child and youth population are also high, at 3.8 percent of GDP per year, in order to achieve universal pre-primary and upper secondary schooling by 2030. Additional investment needs for basic infrastructure for Afghanistan, including transport, ICT, water and sanitation amount to approximately 4% of GDP. Financing the SDGs. As we can see, the financial requirements for meeting the SDGs are quite daunting for Afghanistan, as for other least developed countries. Finding these resources will require a range of the policies. On the domestic side, there is a scope to increase fiscal mobilization through better tax collection and improve fiscal efficiency. However, domestic fiscal resources alone will not be enough to fill the gap. Therefore, there will continue to be an important role for international development cooperation. Furthermore, there is increasing potential for Asia-Pacific South-to-South cooperation through new regional and bilateral modalities. To sum it up, I would like to reiterate that peace and security are prerequisites for inclusive and sustainable development. A national, regional, and global coherence is essential to put an end to the long-lasting war and conflict in Afghanistan. Now that the level of FDA has fallen remarkably, domestic financing mechanisms, particularly promoting private sector, public-private partnership, foreign direct investment, and reforms in taxation system are essential. Furthermore, an agricultural, agriculture-led industrialization strategy, rural modernization, transport infrastructure to connect villages to markets as well as regional connectivity are the areas that will promote inclusive and sustainable development in a landlocked 
least developed country such as Afghanistan. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Osmani, for sharing with us, uh, providing a very comprehensive overview of Afghanistan's economy, the challenges it faces, and the efforts of your government in trying to improve the development prospects of the country. Um, now it's my pleasure to invite Ms. Fatima Niuma, Deputy Minister, Ministry of National Planning and Infrastructure, Government of Maldives, to deliver her keynote address. Ms. Niuma, you have the floor, please. Thank you. <clears throat> Dr. Amida um, Salashia, Under Secretary General at the United Nations and Executive Secretary uh, F of the ESCAP, uh, His Excellency Mr. Ahmed Osmani, Deputy Minister on Administration, Professor Yasu Yuki, Chief Economist at ADB, and Dr. Hamza. Uh, honorable delegates, Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, assalamu alaikum. It gives me great pleasure to have this opportunity to speak at the second session of the Macroeconomic Policy and Poverty Reduction and Financing for Development, and I thank the UNSCAP for this opportunity extended. Distinguished delegates, my note today will be basic, uh, mainly on the graduation of Maldives from an L LDC into a middle-income country. The UN resolution adopted on December 20th, 2004, endorsed and adopted the, that the Maldives was set to graduate from the list of LDCs on January 1st, 2008. But just after six days of adoption of the resolution, the Indian Ocean tsunami struck the Maldives. The Maldivian economy, which had grown at an average of 8% per annum for two consecutive years, was devastated by the tsunami. 62% of our GDP was destroyed. Over 7% of the population was internally displaced. Social and economic infrastructure was damaged or destroyed in over one quarter of the inhabited islands. 12 of these islands were turned into complete rubble. Following the disaster and upon the request of the government of Maldives, the General Assembly decided to defer our graduation until 2011 with a smooth transition period until 2014. The transition was not an easy start to begin with, but with determination and support from the global community, Maldives was able to overcome it. Ladies and gentlemen, since 1971, Maldives is one of the only three countries that have graduated from the ranks of the world's least developed countries, the other two being Botswana and Cape Verde. Graduating from LDC status does not help a country overcome the development challenges it faces. Graduation does not make a country less vulnerable to consequences of its geography. The Maldives, like many other small island developing states, still remain vulnerable to external economic and environmental shocks, despite having graduated from LDC status. To emphasize on this point, I would like to note that immediately after graduation, our tourism growth rate fell from 7.5% in 2011 to 3.6% in 2012 as a direct result of the global economic crisis. For a country whose GDP contribution from tourism is more than 70%, this was a devastating setback. Ladies and gentlemen, like many other small island developing states, Maldives has achieved their current development status due to high and consistent investment in human resources, social sector, as well as government administration. This leaves limited financial resources for the country to prepare for natural disasters or carry out mitigation and adaptation measures. Environmental sustainability is a fundamental development challenge for us. Indeed, it is so critical to future development and prosperity of the country that our new constitution mandates that the protection of environment is a key human right. The Maldives' vulnerability to climate change calls for innovative solutions on adaptation and mitigation. We are particularly susceptible to the projected adverse consequences of climate change, including sea level rise, increase in sea surface temperatures, ocean acidification, and higher frequency and intensity of droughts and storms. The country's fiscal position has been under much stress following the tsunami and has continued to weaken in the face of high unsustainable public expenditure, leaving the Maldives prone to additional shocks. 
The newly elected government in November 2018 had inherited a debt of over 70% of our GDP while promising to bring economic and social progress. Given the tightening global financial arena, the government is committed to undertake significant tax and public finance reforms and fight corruption in order to address this issue. Notwithstanding the progress made, access to financing for development remains a significant concern for the Maldives. Four years on from the adoption of the Addis Ababa Action Agenda, which was designed to finance the transformative, 2019, transformative 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development, SIDS continue to struggle to finance our most basic infrastructure needs. Unless we pay exorbitant interest rates, this is still a challenge. Maldives will do its part to increase domestic resource mobilization and improve fiscal prudence. We call upon our international partners and financial institutions to work together with us to ensure sustainable development and prosperity for all. This will only be possible through concessional financing for SIDS and other innovative financial instruments designed to reduce risk and support effective debt, debt management. Distinguished delegates, Maldives has been graduated from the category of LDCs largely based on its per capita gross national income and performance of its social indicators. For a small and highly dispersed country like the Maldives, little if any consideration has been given to the high per capita cost of providing basic services to its people that has, re that has resulted in these favorable indicators in the first place. No analysis has been done to understand how the country has managed to uplift the social indicators prior to graduation. If analyzed at a micro level, it would not be difficult to see that donor intervention has played a significant role in providing affordable social services to populations on distant islands. At the time of graduation, there was a particular concern about our fishery exports. Although it makes up a small percent of the GDP, it is related very closely to the livelihoods of many Maldivians across the country. Approximately 30% of our fish product exports went to Europe, and with graduation, Maldives lost its LDC-specific incentives, placing our product at a significant competitive disadvantage. Therefore, the Maldivian government worked on a smooth transition strategy with a focus on whether possible maintaining important preferences and securing clearly scheduled gradual removal since full retention removed the possibility of mitigating the impact on tuna exports. Ladies and gentlemen, we take pride in our tourism sector, which is very much developed and operated by the pri private sector. To broaden our economy base, Maldives is looking to diversify its industries within the established sectors of tourism and fisheries, and aims to explore new areas such as aquaculture, transport, and ICT. To this end, a crucial policy intervention was made to diversify the tourism sector in 2011. With the introduction of local tourism or the guest house policy, inhabited islands have prospered beyond our initial expectations. The guest house industry over a short few years have established themselves and become self-sustaining. While maintain maintaining an average occupancy of 70% throughout the year, this initiative has offered new career prospects and sources of income to remote island communities across the country. Distinguished delegates, Maldives faced a range of new challenges upon graduation, benefits from a range of special support measures from bilateral donors and multilater multilateral organizations, and special treatment under regional and multilateral agreements were no longer available. Yet, we continue to invest in, in the provision of basic services to the people and maintaining the achievement of social indicators that we have gained over the years. Countries often rely on multilateral and bilateral donors for assistance for various development projects, donors that often assess a country's need by its developmental status at the UN, which traps countries such as the Maldives in a vicious, vicious cycle that has been termed as middle income paradox. Therefore, conventional measures of national development applied to assess whether a country qualifies for assistance by a donor does not apply to the situation in Maldives and many other small island developing states. An innovative measure to truly capture the development dynamics of small, highly dispersed island countries like the Maldives need to, need to be developed and a system must be set in place to conduct regular studies for consideration of the International Donor Committee which may provide assistance to such countries.
We hope our development partners will take significant steps towards acknowledging these vulnerabilities. It is our hope that small and vulnerable economies are given, are given the acknowledgement and support they need to endure. In a sense, it must be an obligation of the international community, in particular the United Nations, to ensure that the progress made by graduating countries is not reversed and that well, inherent vulnerabilities are not disregarded. Although the same acute vulnerabilities at economic, commercial, and environment levels from the time we were in LDC persist, we were determined to move forward. We focused on building our national resilience. We built strong and mutually beneficial partnerships with emerging economies and experienced with new policy instruments. Ladies and gentlemen, what small island developing states like the Maldives that are in the middle income country category seek are opportunities. For us, development cooperation should come in the form of opportunities for trade, opportunities, opportunities to attract new investments, and opportunity to bounce back whenever we face exogenous shock. Only then will development cooperation serve a meaningful purpose for small middle income countries and their people. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Ms. Nima, for your insightful uh, observations, very unique challenges faced by a small island developing country. Uh, Maldives, indeed, is a special case when it comes to understanding and studying uh, countries that are slated to graduate from at least developed country status. And I, if I'm not wrong, there are, I think, 10 of the 12 uh, that these developed countries are slated to graduate in the next four to five years. So a lot of lessons to be learned from the experiences of Maldives. Um, now it's my pleasure to invite uh, Mr. Yasuyuki Sawada, Chief Economist and Director General, Economic Research and Regional Cooperation Department, Asian Development Bank, to deliver his keynote remarks. Mr. Sawada, you have the floor, please. Dr. Alumida Arisambana, uh, Under Secretary General of the United Nations, Executive Secretary of ESCAP, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, a very good morning. I'd like to thank um, uh, the U uh, uh, UNSCAP for the kind invitation. I'm delighted very much to be here today and talk about ADB's experience in assisting our developing member countries and economies towards improved capacity for domestic resource mobilization, along with efforts to strengthen regional cooperation in achieving the sustainable development goals. According to ADB's latest update, Economic growth in Asia and the Pacific is expected to remain robust, but slightly moderate. GDP expansion in the region is projected to slow from 5.9% growth rate last year, uh, uh, slightly down to 5.4% this year, then edge back up to 5.5% next year. Our outlook for growth is undermined by gloomier prospects for international trade and evidence of slowing growth in advanced economies. Amid the challenges posed by external environment, Asia must be prepared to implement strategy to enable to continue improve quality of life and work toward inclusive growth. Key to the region is achieving the sustainable development goals which require massive new international, domestic, public, and private financial support. ADB supports the enhanced ambition the SDGs embody, building better, more sustainable infrastructure, an area in which ADB excels will provide a basis for achieving the SDGs. ADB's vision of a prosperous, inclusive, resilient, and sustainable Asian Pacific, which is a strategy 2030 is aligned with SDGs and the 2030 Agenda for Development. Let me highlight some of the important measures ADB has undertaken to align its work with the SDGs. First, ADB has tracked the links between its projects and SDGs since year 2016 and is improving, monitoring how the projects and programs it finances will support SDG targets. Second, ADB is engaging 
its developing member countries and economies on SDG implementation and identifying new investments that will accelerate progress towards targets. Third, ADB is partnering with United Nations system, other multilateral development banks, civil society, its knowledge partners, and the private sector on the SDGs. While Asia has been the engine of global growth, continued investment in infrastructure is indispensable for keeping the growth momentum as well as poverty reduction trend. Over 400 million Asians live without electricity, 300 million without safe drinking water, and staggering 1.5 billion without basic sanitation. According to ADB study, uh, 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 disseminated in year 2017, developing Asia will need to invest 26 trillion US dollars over the time horizon of the SDGs, or 1.7 trillion per year, if the region is to maintain growth momentum, eradicate poverty, and respond to climate change. The region annually invests an estimated 881 billion in infrastructure. Therefore, the infrastructure investment gap, that is difference between investment needs and current investment level, equals 2.4% of projected GDP currently. A key challenge in addressing the infrastructure investment gap is first, promoting private sector participation, and second, expanding the fiscal space. In promoting private sector participation, creating and conducive investment climate, including investors' protection, political and macroeconomic stability, good governance, policy for promoting private sector participation, and sound market regulation are the key elements. Greater use of public-private partnership, PPP, is also critical. PPP is a set of uh, PPP laws, streamlined procurement and bidding processes, dispute resolution mechanisms, and um, well-defined uh, independent PPP units. Also, it's important to achieve deepening capital market uh, development, including bond markets, market infrastructure, credit rating, and bankruptcy system. As for the second uh, component to fulfill infrastructure investment gap, while Asia is uh, 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 generally adhered to prudent fiscal policies, especially after the financial, Asian financial crisis, important remaining issue for many developing Asian countries and economies is the low tax revenue to GDP ratio. This constraints current expenditure for much needed education, health, and other public services, and lowers public investment available for infrastructure. In this respect, strengthening the revenue mobilization capacity of developing Asian Pacific is critical in enhancing the tax base and finance capacity to address infrastructure needs and pursue SDGs. Allow me to share with you what ADB has undertaken to promote domestic resource mobilization. At ADB, public sector management, PSM, is one of the core sectors of support and public Finance management, PFM, including taxation, is one of the main subsectors of operation. ADB has been long time supporting domestic resource mobilization through regional and country specific technical assistance, TA, and TA loans, as well as policy based lending and grant. In year 2014, ADB started the Semantic Regional Technical Assistance Project that replaced the annual tax conference, which started in year 1991. The first TA project aimed to enhance tax transparency and exchange of information by promoting regional tax cooperation in partnership with the study group on Asian administration and research. In short, SGATAR, Center for Tax Policy and Administration in OECD, and the Global Forum on Transparency and Exchange of Information for Tax Purpose, in short, Global Forum. ADB has participated in uh, the annual meetings of SGATAR since year 2014, and also participated in the Pacific Island Tax Administration Association, PITAA, annual head meetings. In enhancing collaboration with regional tax bodies, 
ADB invited secretariats of SGATAR and PITAA to ADB training workshops and hold a joint training seminar with Global Forum and PITAA on tax transparency and exchange information for tax purposes. ADB has expanded its support for taxation. In April uh, 2016, ADB became a supportive member for the Addis Tax Initiative, ATI, and updated anti-corruption policy to set out its response to tax integrity. Then, in 2017, ADB established the Domestic Resource Mobilization Trust Fund, which enables to provide more effective and sustainable technical assistance project on tax and domestic resource mobilization. Currently, at the regional level, ADB is implementing several regional technical assistance programs through first, regional cooperation, uh, regional conferences, second, tax policy and administration research, and third, training seminars on tax issues, aiming to identify challenges of these tax authorities face and to enhance the capacity and regional cooperation tax authority. Also, boosting domestic resource mobilization resources, uh, also boosting domestic resource mobilization requires collective action in the region. Globalization has brought tremendous economic benefits, but it has also opened up windows for multilateral enterprises to take aggressive action to minimize their tax burdens. Base erosion and profit sharing, BEPS, undermines the integrity of tax system and has become a critical issue for governments, taxpayers, and businesses. Rapid digitization also poses special challenges for international taxation. The digital economy is often characterized by a large buildup of intangible assets, heavy reliance on data for creating economic value, various new business models capturing value from platforms, and the difficulty of determining the jurisdiction in which value creation occurs. All of this lead to fundamental questions as to how techni technology companies generate economic activities and values and make their profits, and how to define income sources of company residents for tax purposes. While tax base erosion is a problem for all countries, it is especially a serious issue for developing countries since this deprives them of much needed fiscal response to invest in infrastructure needed to achieve sustainable development goals. ADB recognizes that it has a role to play in supporting global efforts to combat tax evasion and erosion of the domestic tax base of developing member countries and economies. It recognizes the need to strengthen regional tax cooperation among countries. ADB support include areas such as enhancing the ability of its de developing member countries to protect themselves against tax evasions and BEPS, and also developing capacity of uh, developing member countries to become uh, members and participate in the work of the Global Forum. ADB's vast experience and in-depth knowledge of member countries, together with financing resources, make it well-placed to effectively contribute towards improved tax capacity, domestic resource mobilization, public sector performance, and public finance management in the region. With that, I'd like to stop my uh, speech here. Uh, thank you very much for your time and attention. Thank you very much, Sabada San, for a very comprehensive overview of different areas where ADB is actively supporting member states. Uh, at ASCAP, we really value our uh, collaboration in several areas, and we look forward to working with ADB together to, support, to provide support to member states in several areas as outlined by in your remarks. Um, this concludes, actually, agenda item 1A, and I think the three addresses gave us good overarching ideas about different issues that will be discussed in this committee and different agenda items in the next two or three days. Um, so before we move on to the next agenda item, let's give a
Okay, distinguished delegates, ladies and gentlemen, let's now move on to agenda item 1B, the election of officers to the Bureau of the Committee. The Bureau will comprise a chair and two vice chairs. So may I please open the floor for any nominations. I recognize the distinguished delegate from Bhutan. You have the floor, sir. Uh, good morning. Excellencies, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of my delegation, I have the honor to propose Mr. Ribbon Khan, Secretary General, National Committee for SCAP, as the chair of the VIRU. Further, I would like to propose the following delegates as the vice chairs. Ms. Samantha K. Jayasuriya, Ambassador and Permanent Representative of Sri Lanka to SCAP. Mr. Komraj Raj Koirala, Joint Secretary, National Planning Commission of Nepal. My delegation's uh, proposal of the view is based upon various considerations, such as seniority and experience on the macroeconomic policy, poverty reduction, and financing for developing issues, as well as gender balance. I am confident that under their able leadership, we will have engaging and fruitful deliberations of the sec second session of the Committee on macro Macroeconomic Policy poverty reduction, and financing for development. Thank you. Um, thank you, distinguished delegate of Bhutan. Um, do any other delegate wish to suggest alternative nominations or second these nominations? I recognize the distinguished delegate from Bangladesh. Distinguished delegates, ladies and gentlemen, very good morning to all of you. On behalf of my delegation, I have the honor to seconding the names of the Bureau of the Committee of Macroeconomic Policy, Poverty Reduction, and Financing for Development at its second session. I thank you all. Uh, thank you, distinguished delegate of Bangladesh. Um, do we have any other delegate who wishes to suggest alternative nominations or second these nominations? Uh, I see none. So I have the pleasure to formally announce that the Bureau of the Second Session of the Committee on Macroeconomic Policy, Poverty Reduction and Financing for Development is composed of the following. As Chair, we have Mr. Reborn Com, Secretary General, National Committee, of ASCA, National Committee for ASCAP, Cambodia. As Vice Chairs, we have Ms. Samantha Jayasuriya, Ambassador and Permanent Representative of Sri Lanka to ASCAP, Embassy of Sri Lanka based in Bangkok and Mr. Homraj Raj Koirala, Joint Secretary, National Planning Commission, Nepal. Please join me in congratulating the Bureau for the election. Okay, let me now, I'm very pleased to invite the chair of the meeting to take his seat as the rostrum. Thank you. Excellencies, distinguished delegates, ladies and gentlemen, it is indeed an honor and privilege for me to assume the chair of this important meeting. On behalf of the other members of the Bureau, I wish to express our appreciation to the distinguished representatives 
for the confidence you have placed in us. As the chair of the second session of the Committee on Macroeconomic Policy, Poverty Reduction and Financing for Development, I shall do my best to ensure that this meeting achieves its objectives and produces fruitful outcomes for our future works together. In this connection, I would like to rely on the spirit of cooperation and, and involvement of all distinguished delegates and the Apple support of the members of the Bureau. Please allow me to also express my appreciation to the Secretariat of ASCAP for arrangement of this meeting. Furthermore, I also would like to express my appreciation to our distinguished special speakers for the delivery of the thoughtful messages during the opening session. Before starting, I would like to make a few annou housekeeping announcements. First, if, if your delegation wishes to register to speak or deliver a statement on your on any agenda item, please fill in one of the forms available on the desk in front of you and bring it to the conference officer who is sitting on the left. Not, not Dr. Malik, actually on the left. Second, in case of your delegation wishes to, to arrange a bilateral meeting with other delegation participating in this conference, the same conference officer will be able to help you as well. Excellencies, distinguished delegates, ladies and gentlemen, let me now take up agenda item 1C, adoption of the agenda. The provisional agenda is contained in document ASCAP slash CMPF slash 2019-L.1. Are there any comments on the agenda? Please. No? If there are no comments, the agenda in the document ASCAP slash CMPF slash 2019 slash L.1 is adopted. So before I adjourn this meeting, I should like to inform all delegates that the committee will resume promptly at 10.30 a.m. in this conference room to consider the agenda item two. I understand that the Secretariat has some announcements to make. So now I would like to invite the Secretariat to, make the floor, to take the floor. Thank you. Thank you. Distinguished uh, guests, uh, delegates, ladies and gentlemen, uh, it is my pleasure to invite head of your delegation and your organization uh, to come to the in front of the rostrum for a group photo. Thank you. Now I declare the meeting adjourned. So head of your delegation or your organization, one member per state. And after the group photo, we'll have refreshments outside.
Thank you, everyone. The refreshments are right outside the conference room. If you can join us, and we will start right at 1030 in about 24 minutes.